They told me I was doing everything right, but my numbers said otherwise. I counted carbs, I pre bolused I followed every rule in the book, but my insulin just stopped working the way it used to. I remember scrolling through my CGM data, just frustrated, super confused, and I mean, honestly, a little defeated. And what I discovered next completely reframed how I treat my diabetes, and most people, even doctors, don't talk about it. See, in this video, I'm gonna show you three things. Number one, the overlooked reason that your insulin might not be working. Number two, the nutrition shift that changed my sensitivity to insulin in 72 hours. And three, the T1D trap that's keeping your numbers unpredictable and how to fix it. Now, if you don't know who I am, my name is Matt Vandevecht. I'm a type one diabetes coach, certified master fitness trainer and nutritionist. I'm a best-selling author and an Ironman athlete. And I've lived with type one diabetes for 16 years. I've spent the last decade helping thousands of people bring predictability back to their blood sugars and their lives. But a quick heads up, if you want to go even deeper on everything I'm about to share today, it's all broken down step by step in my number one best selling book, The Blood Sugar Freedom Formula. I'll link it in the description as well as here so you can grab it while you're listening. All right, let's dig in. Here's what was happening to my blood sugars, why I felt like my insulin wasn't working. My blood sugars started creeping higher, which we're all familiar with. It's happened a time before. My correction ratios seemed to stop working. Meals that used to be predictable suddenly weren't. And I did what most of us do. I blamed myself, right? Maybe I miscounted my carbs. Maybe my pump site was bad for my insulin pump. Maybe I just needed more insulin. Though honestly, sometimes it felt like I was injecting water because the insulin that I gave seemed to do nothing. No matter how much I fine tuned or paid attention or put the effort in, nothing worked. And the frustrating truth, the problem wasn't the insulin. It was the environment my body was in. Let me explain. So I ran a 72 hour experiment to see if I could change that environment without changing the actual insulin dose because clearly it wasn't working. What I found completely changed the way I think about blood sugar management. So let's talk about what's really going on inside your cells because when insulin suddenly stops working, the issue isn't your pancreas because <laughs> for those of us with type one diabetes, it's not working anyways, right? It's your receptors. Think about insulin like a key and your cells like a lock. Most people assume that if the key isn't working, you just need a stronger key or more insulin, right? But sometimes the lock itself is jammed and that's what happened to me. And the culprit was something most people have never even heard of, ceramides. So, I mean, if geek out with me for a second here, right? Inside your cells, insulin lands on its receptor and sends a signal through a pathway. IRS1, PL3K, I think it was, AKT, all the way to GLUT4. And GLUT4 is the transporter that opens the door and lets glucose into the cell. Side tangent here, GLUT4 transports are actually what your muscles use to absorb glucose from your bloodstream as well after a workout, which is why workouts are amazing tools for increasing insulin sensitivity. So what happens is that we will go into this in maybe the next video, but when you, you work out your muscles, you're squeezing them like you squeeze a sponge. It releases glucose. Afterwards, it wants to soak glucose back up to store as muscle glycogen or stored energy. So after you've worked out, your muscles through GLUT4 transports will soak up glucose, meaning you actually might need less insulin for the same food you normally eat if you've had a recent workout. Honestly, it's half the reason I'm still consistent with my workouts because I know it helps my blood sugars, all right? Now, when that pathway is clear, your blood sugar drops as expected, right? But when that pathway gets blocked, no matter how much insulin you take, the doors don't open, at least not as much. It's like the door cracks open right, instead of swings fully open. And that's where ceramides come in. So ceramides are fat-based molecules created when your body has too much stress, too much inflammation, or too much of a certain mix of foods, especially high fat and high carb. Now, don't hate me for this, all right? <laughs> I already know some of you are like, that's my diet though, and I'm supposed to eat that way. My doctor told me I'm supposed to eat a certain way and I have to follow it. It's not true necessarily. And I'm not gonna come out and say that your doctor is wrong because I probably don't know your doctor. 
unless you have a really well-known one, then maybe I do. But the chances that they've found the one diet that works for every diabetic ever are slim to none. The reason is that we're all quite different, right? So what someone might uh, find is working for them very well might be because their body is attuned to that specific type of diet, or maybe they have preferences or allergies, right? So when I'm lumping things together here and saying high fat, high carb, it doesn't mean that it's right or wrong. I'm just giving the science behind this. I wanna make sure you understand. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings because I know some of you feel very strongly about which diet you're following. I'm not here to pick sides or pick fights, okay? Now, all that to say, <laughs> the general science does have a few things to say about this. So with high fat and high carb meals, they're eaten together, it's a metabolic mess, okay? And this is something that, that uh, experts on both sides, the high fat, low carb diets and the high carb, low fat diets can agree on is that high fat and high carb is a wreck for your metabolic system, okay? So high fat and high carb, we're talking about here, they literally act like gunk in the lock. So the lock we talked about with your cells, your cells are the lock, insulin is the key. Having a high fat, high carb diet together is acting as gunk in the lock of your cells to make it harder for insulin to unlock the cell for the transport of glucose. When you eat food, you just store that food in your cells, right? So they block the insulin signal, specifically at the AKT step. So glucose can't enter efficiently. So it's like your cells are, are hearing static instead of the message, right? So you inject more insulin like I did, but it still doesn't quite do its job. Now, here's the wild part. Ceramide buildup isn't permanent, which is great. Good news for us, right? You can start reversing it in as little as 72 hours. Now, there's a couple different ways to go about this. And when we look at insulin resistance and insulin sensitivity, which I talk directly about in my book, it's not that you are or are not insulin resistant as a diagnosis. It exists on a spectrum. So today, I am personally more insulin resistant than I was yesterday. Why? It's a combination of things. One, I didn't sleep great last night because my CGM woke me up 15 times with false low blood sugars that didn't exist and I had to take my sensor off and put a new one on. I'm still bitter about this if you can't tell. I got like three and a half hours of sleep because my CGM was malfunctioning all night long. Lack of sleep increases cortisol and inflammation, increases insulin resistance, okay? Today's different than yesterday. Two, I'm overtraining right now. <laughs> it's just, it's a bad habit. Uh, I did some really intense training two days ago, really intense training yesterday, and again, really intense training today because we're taking the next three days off to go to Disneyland. So I thought, oh, I'll just squeeze in all my workouts. It's not wise. You can actually overtrain and it starts to lose its benefit, which is what I'm seeing as well. And number three, dietary choices have shifted. I made some poor choices with my diet. As a result, more insulin resistance. Day to day it changes. This is why I spent an entire chapter of this on my book, The Blood Sugar Freedom Formula. I'll link it up here. If you want to check it out, you can grab it on Amazon or we'll put it in the description as well. But an entire chapter was dedicated to this concept that insulin resistance is not a yes or a no, it's a how much because it can change day to day. And it's critical that you understand that. So when we think about insulin resistance day to day can change, it's about dietary shifts, yes, but it's also about your sleep habits, your stress, your exercise routines. All of these things come together in a, this magical equation, which is a formula that tells us how much more or how much less insulin should I give. On the opposite side of the spectrum, you didn't ask this, but I'm going there. When you exercise a ton, like when I did my Ironman race, you might need next to no insulin. The next day after my Ironman, I ate 90 carbs for breakfast, didn't take any additional insulin, and I stayed at non-diabetic numbers because I was so insulin sensitive. It was wild. Now, I still needed basal insulin, but it was still pretty cool. All that to say, I want to make sure that you understand that the surrounding environment of this, because you can start reversing these ceramides in as little as 72 hours and see an improvement in the reduction of insulin resistance, but there are different ways to go about it. Okay, we'll touch on those in a second. So when I changed one simple thing in my nutrition rhythm recently, not the total carbs, not the insulin dose, not the workouts, right? And workouts are pretty consistent for me as well. My insulin sensitivity shot up in three days. 
Now, three days specifically has to do more with nutrition than it does anything. You could go exercise right now and see an immediate impact. This is why walks are so powerful. They can be a fantastic way to bring blood glucose down when you have a stubborn high, although it doesn't always work if there's just a lack of insulin, right? So there's a lot of pieces to this puzzle and it's critical that we see all sides of it because diabetes is complicated. So let's connect the dots. Where do ceramides come from? They come from your food environment, constantly eating energy dense meals, high caloric dense meals, high fat, high carbs, especially, right? Two is inflammation. So chronic stress and poor recovery increase inflammatory signaling. I am dealing with that right now. Chronic stress, poor recovery, not sleeping and over exercising, right? Another one, sleep on that topic and cortisol. So when you're underslept or overstressed, your liver pumps out more glucose, you'll see higher cortisol release and your cells become less responsive. In other words, insulin resistant isn't just about eating too much or eating the wrong food. It's about the state your cells are living in. And by the way, if this kind of clarity is clicking for you and you wanna learn how to build predictability into your numbers every single day. I'm sitting at 14 days of 100% time and range right now. I put together a free training on what we call blood sugar formulas that walks you through an overview of my exact formulas for nutrition, timing, stress management, and exercise. You can grab it at the link in the description or right here. It's 100% free. All right, so let's bring this science home and make this practical for you. So here's the bottom line. If your insulin isn't working like it used to, it doesn't necessarily mean you're broken. It means your cells are under pressure. Your body is basically saying, hey, I've got too much on my plate. Let's clean the house before we take in more energy, right? And this is assuming other variables are constant. So assuming your insulin isn't actually bad, because that can happen. It's assuming your injection site or your insulin pump site location isn't actually bad or inflamed or got ripped out, right? There's other things you gotta check off the boxes first as well. But the good news, we can fix those things too, right? It's just harder to, to spot sometimes if your insulin did go bad. But as far as your cells, we can fix that as well. Okay, so here's how to start your 72 hour sensitivity reset. And we actually did a full workshop reset with my clients. It was a ton of fun, but I'll give you the basics on today's days one through three right now, okay? So day one, we'll, we'll say day one through three, focus on your meals, all right? So lower fat, Fiber rich foods, this doesn't mean you have to be low fat if your entire thing is keto, but generally speaking, because this is a general video for all of you, it's not a private coaching video. Generally speaking, lower fat is gonna be helpful for this, specifically for the reset. Fiber rich is gonna help you get microbiome, it's gonna help with the digestion and blood sugars as well. And when you eat carbs, it's helpful to have these things balanced out, but protein is good for you too. Protein can also slow down digestion and make blood sugars easier, but it does convert to glucose at a rate of about 50% down the road. So you might have to consider insulin for that later. Now add 45 minutes of easy, steady movement every day. Like think of a zone two pace where you can still hold a conversation. So like I'm talking to you right now, I might go for a walk or I'll hop on my bike and just go super, super light, nothing hard. But that zone two pace is gonna help to improve insulin sensitivity. It also increases mitochondrial density. So you remember, Mitochondria, it's the powerhouse of the cell. It's important here, okay? Next, number three is to sleep eight hours, like as a minimum. And this is a hard one for me too, but no screens, don't get mad at me, for a minimum of 30 minutes before bed. Ideally, we're talking one to two hours before bed. You should stop screens. That blue light signals to your brain, wake up, wake up. You gotta shut that off. Get yourself a bedtime routine start relaxing a bit earlier. Number four, hydrate like it's your job. Electrolytes are a big bonus here as well. Okay, so this is days one through three, those four things I want you to focus on. And the goal here isn't perfection, it's recovery. It's reteaching your body to listen to insulin again. And when it does, everything feels easier. Your numbers respond faster, your doses come down naturally. You stop fighting your diabetes and start partnering with it. Like that's the real shift here right? And here's the trap most people fall into. I call it the T1D numbers trap. And I'm the numbers guy. So hear me out. We're trained to chase perfect numbers. But when the numbers get worse, we just push harder, right? More insulin, more stress, more guilt. The problem is every time we do that without addressing why the numbers changed, we dig the hole deeper. 
if you're feeling unpredictable, frustrated, or burnt out, it's not because you're doing it wrong. It's because you're, you're trying to manage a system that's out of balance, right? And this journey isn't just about controlling diabetes harder. It's about building a body that responds better. This is the core of our program mantra that I work with clients on to think differently. It's not always the surface level stuff. Oh, my insulin's not working. Just take more. There might be a systemic change that's necessary. And I'll be honest, this shift changed my entire life. I used to, and still sometimes do, just push harder when things aren't working, right? I feel like it's that resilience, that, that uh, persistent nature of mine. And I, I plan on working on this, all right? When things aren't working to not just push harder, I'm working on pushing smarter, right? And when I finally realized that insulin resistance wasn't always something that just happens to type ones, but something that I could influence, that I could manipulate intentionally even, everything changed. I even spent a full chapter on this topic in my best-selling book, The Blood Sugar Freedom Formula. I'll put it up right here for you again or in the description. See, when this happened, when I understood this, my energy came back. My workouts started working again. And admittedly, I'm human. I made the same mistake today. <laughs> like I'm still working on it, all right? But when you know what to do, it at least gives you that first step towards implementing properly. My blood sugars finally felt predictable again when I started following these steps, when I started taking care of my body, paying attention to these things that I never even knew existed, ceramides that was never discussed with me by my medical team. I doubt they even know what that is. It's, I just learned about it. It's pretty fascinating, actually. Start small. Take back control of your environment. Set yourself up inside for wins. Give your body a chance to respond again. And if you want to go deeper into these strategies, check out the next video on the screen in the next episode. I'll put it right there for a full framework that started it all. You're not broken. Your body is capable of healing. And you're absolutely not alone in this journey. I'll see you in the next video. It's sitting right there. And keep up the fight.